Okay, I'm, I'm going to start talking about the noise mechanisms in, in electric motors. Now, this is a really big subject. I, I mean, really, there, there are like 400 page books written on this. So to kind of keep it manageable and, and keep it at the, at the proper level, I am going to kind of take a step back and I'm going to tell you that I'm not going to talk about all the things that can be done at the design stage to make a motor quiet. There are many, many, many things that can be done at the design stage. However, um, if this is something that you're interested in, uh, our engineering partner, EOMIS, which is a French company, uh, has a really nice webinar series that deals specifically with NVH design. Uh, it's not, so this is Electric Motors 201. It's more like an Electric Motors 501 course, right? It's more the graduate level. So, uh, uh, but it is an excellent series. I've seen almost all, all of these webinars um, and I would recommend them. So the emphasis of this talk is going to be more on understanding the basic mechanisms of the motor NVH uh, rather than the, the, thing, the parts in the design. So we will get a little into that because that is important. Um, so consider the simple synchronous motor. Uh, so the rotor, we've already talked about how this is a powerful magnet. And around the outside, we have a, we have a shell made of, made of steel. And what do magnets do to steel? They attract it. So there are very, and um, the other thing is we want the slots to be very small because that kind of magnet, that maximizes the, the, uh, the power of the magnetic field. So we have very strong magnet next to a very magnetic shell. And what happens? It exerts force on it. So we're pulling really hard right here, light pulling there, heavy pulling here, et cetera, as we, as we go around. Um, these very strong radial forces are called Maxwell forces. And as the rotor spins, these Maxwell forces are exerting an alternating force on the shell that creates noise. That's one of the primary uh, noise mechanism for a motor at low frequency. The fundamental excitation frequency of this is the number of pole pairs times the RPM, the speed in RPM divided by 60, or the number of pole pairs times the rotational speed in hertz. Well, it's kind of simple. When you, when you, this is a, um, this has, this has two pole pairs. When you, when this rotates around so that this north is at the bottom, it looks exactly the same. So we have this kind of physical symmetry that's, des that's designing, that's driving the frequency that we, that we see. And we also have frequencies that correspond to the number of slots. So it would, so as we move from here to there, to there, to there, we also have that type of physical symmetry. Um, so, we would have a, a, a fundamental excitation frequency co uh, corresponding to the number of slots. There would be the number of slots times uh, times the speed in hertz. Similarly, uh, as those alternating forces also create uh, torque, the, they create torque. So we have tangential forces, and they produce torque ripple. So we also so we have alternating um, alternating torque, which we call torque ripple. Um, Mitch was talking about torque ripple earlier, and there are also harmonics. This is a, a sine wave machine. This is a kind of a complex shaped wave machine. So we have harmonics of each of those. So if we have a 50 hertz fundamental, then we're going to see 100 hertz and 150 and 200 hertz uh, harmonics of that. And as Mitch talks about, talked about earlier, we also have the inverter switching noise. The induction motor is a little bit more complicated because we have the excitation frequency around the outside. So let's say we're exciting the outside around at uh, 60 times per second. Well, the rotor maybe turns at 50 times per second, so we have those two different sets of frequencies. So we have around the outside we have um, 120, 240, and then around the inside we have 50, 100, 150. This is something in NVH we call a color map. 
and the brightness of the plot tells you how strong it is. And this is from an accelerometer that we had attached to the stator of an electric motor. And the x-axis is the frequency in hertz. The y-axis is the is the RPM in in this case in uh, uh, revolutions per minute. This line right here is what we call the first order line. So that means that when the motor turns around one time, something happens once per revolution. This is the second order peak right here. That means that when the motor turns around one time, something has happened two times during that, etc. cetera. Uh, this motor is a tenth order, or tenth, has tenfold pairs. So this tenth order uh, order is particularly bright in, in this. But see, there's a lot of other orders too, because no motor is perfect, especially this one that we were, we were dealing with. So, but even for perfectly made motors, noise is produced by the alternating for forces. The Maxwell forces, like we discussed earlier, the strong, uh, the strong, uh, 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 the strong uh, circum circumferential forces. Uh, they're also produced by discontinuities in the slots. They're also produced by discontinuities moving from one magnet to the other magnet, and also in discontinuities in the electrical excitation, which in a broader sense also includes the, tor the, uh, the torque ripple and the switching noise, that type of thing. For non-perfect motors, or in other words, every motor ever made, um, there are also other issues too. Um, there can be a, a current amplitude imbalance. If So in a motor, you have hundreds of feet of wire uh, and that wire is insulated from other wires by, by varnish. If somewhere in the process there's a slight nick, nick in one of those wires, um, there'll be a, there can be a slight short between the two, between adjacent, adjacent wires. Um, that's actually really common. So it's, and that motor will probably work just fine. There's hundreds and hundreds of windings and two of them are bad. So the, the motor still works just fine. So there can be current amplitude imbalance. There can be demagnetization um, or unequal magnetization. Every magnet is not exactly the same strength as, as, as it's supposed to be. If there's pole pairs and one of them's 10, the next one doesn't necessarily a value of 10. It might be a 9.5 and the next one might be something different. As, and this is pretty, pretty common because, because um, the rare earth magnets are made out of materials that are dug up out of the ground. So they're not going to be a perfect purity. There's going to be some difference between the different magnets. Um, if, the, if the stator isn't perfectly round, you can also get uh, alternating forces. Now consider that one of our design goals was to make the, the gaps between the, the rotors and the stators as small as possible. So that if there's even a small error in, in the size or the shape of the, the rotor, it, the, uh, the uh, stator gap, the gaps will, will uh, be changing a fairly strong percentage. Um, the poles can be misplaced and we can have different types of eccentricity of the, of the rotor. Maybe it's shaped like an egg. Maybe um, it, it doesn't rotate directly around the center line. Maybe it, uh, kind of does a hula dance because one end uh, has a different uh, uh, rotational center than the other end. And like I said, these imperfections are present in all motors, but particularly in the low cost applications. So if, if you looked at the, uh, the drive motor for a car, they, every, everyone may be very similar to each other. If you were to look at um, electric motor for a fan and you had a hundred of them, they may all sound noticeably different from one another. We'll talk a little bit about uh, about the excitation of the shell, uh, you know, by the Maxwell forces. The shell is a structure and it has natural frequencies. It has a breathing mode where it kind of uh, moves in and out. It has a bending mode where it kind of alternates between 
being shaped like an egg like this and being shaped like an egg like that. It has a next higher mode where uh, the shape more resembles an alternating triangle. Then it has another one that's an alternating quadrangle. It has another one, the next one would be an alternating pentagon, and the one above that would be an alter alternating hexagon, and on it goes forever. Uh, so uh, we have all these different natural frequencies of the stator. Um, and the degree of excitation of these modes depends on the participation factor, which depends on the temporal and spatial matching of the rotor, the excitation forces, and these modes. Now, since this is the excitation is spinning around the inside, it really isn't easy to figure out what the what the uh, participation factor is. If I had the shell and I just attached a shaker to one side of it and drove it, it would be pretty easy to figure out what modes were going to get excited and to what extent they would be excited. That would be something that we could look up an equation in a book and we could we could calculate the level of excitation. But since we have alternating and moving forces at the same time, it's not really a back of the envelope thing anymore. So generally what's done is software is used to determine um, the level of excitation. Um, just as a general design guideline, the best designs preferentially excite higher modes. So you really want to excite like that fifth mode, that sixth mode, seventh, twentieth mode. You don't really want to excite the, the second bending mode of the rotor. Um, and uh, then other things can be done also. Uh, like, for instance, we could stagger the rotors. We could stagger, stag, we could stagger the permanent magnets around the rotor uh, so that they were kind of oriented like a screw to slightly ease the turning on and turning off of the different cycles. This is kind of analogous to using helical gears rather than spur gears in a gear set. Um, that's one of the things that's done to, uh, to smooth out the uh, the transitions in an electric motor make it quieter. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the switching noise. So again, these are color maps, but um, this isn't zero hertz, and this is 10 kilohertz. So this was an electric motor that an experimental electric motor that Mitch and I measured at uh, the Illinois Institute of Technology that was using a switching frequency of 10 kilohertz. Um, so it, it tended to produce a, a uh, switching noise at 10 kilohertz, as measured by this microphone and this accelerometer. Um, what, one of the things that we did is that we also measured the current, which was fairly straightforward. We put a current clamp on the on the one of the phase lines between between the uh, inverter and the motor and produced a corresponding uh, color map here. This is, this axis uh, is like speed, and this axis is frequency. So we have our current bars, and then we also used a high, a high voltage system to measure the voltage and make the voltage measurement and create a color map of the voltage. Okay, why, why did we do all that? Well, if you look at the mic and you really had time to study this and look at this, you will notice that not all these, these bars in the mic signal are present in the current signal. Some of them we have to go to the voltage to get. So if we were, if we were inverter designers, if we were coming up with the control strategy and our NVH engineer said, hey, I have this bar right here, which is particularly annoying in the car, what can you do to control it? we would have to go back to the, the voltage signals to see what we, how we could modify those to reduce this particular bar right here. So, by, so what was really useful for, was for us to use a high voltage measurement. We really needed the voltage. That isn't something you normally get. Um, I can't hook up my normal NVH measurement system to something and measure alternating 400 volts. Like, like this system was. So what we did was we used the HBM Genesis system to acquire the data. So we can acquire it with very high sample rates, 
High sample rates are important because Mitch wants to calculate efficiencies. And as we talked about earlier, when you're switching, you really care what's happening when you're going from an on state to an off state. So you need to sample really fast. We're able to measure high voltage and high current. And the system also has um, ICP or CCLD, as we call it in BNK speak, to, um, to power normal ex excels and microphones. And then we were able to take the data, export it to a standard format, um, downsample it and then use the BK Connect NVH software to do all the things we like to do in, in noise and vibration. So we produce these color maps, we also produce some operating deflection shapes, and uh, also looked at the sound quality of the resulting system. So. so um, kind of as, as a summary for the, for the non-motor design designer, uh, the measurement provides in, insight into a lot of different issues. Uh, you know, what are the orders and what does this tell, tell us about the issue, which we get to by combining, uh, combining our measurements with predictive models. How is the inverter really working and how can it be made better? You know, what are the real voltage signals? Um, an inverter is kind of an unusual animal. When I first started seeing these plots, uh, Mitch explained to me that to get to zero voltage, what you might like to do is have a plus pulse and then a negative pulse right away. Instead of just having a zero voltage, you, you, you combine a plus and a minus. That's, that's how they work with the algorithms that they have. Uh, the motor can be thought of as a black box, and we can look at how they're in, integrated into the product. That's my normal job. Like, how do you repower a car to use a gasoline engine or a diesel engine or an electric motor or a steam engine, what, whatever? And in that case, uh, there are certain tools that we use to, uh, to, to integrate that power plant into, the, into it. You can look and see, are the source levels competitive? If you're, if you're coming out with a new product, um, is the problem the motor or is the problem the vehicle that you've attached it to? The classic and NVH, who, who do you blame? The, the source or the path? And uh, let's say, is, is, the motor, is the motor design NVH robust or can there be wide unit to unit variation? That's, you know, we want to make the motor quiet, but we also want to make them consistent. 